Welcome, Grace family. I'm Micaiah. And I'm Logan. And we're so excited that you are joining us this weekend here at Grace. For any of you who may be attending the online campus for the first time, welcome. Grace is one church in three different locations. We have two physical campuses right here in Sarasota, our Lakewood Ranch campus, which you can see behind us, as well as our Bee Ridge campus. And we also have our online campus where we have the privilege to stream our services during the weekend and provide life-giving Bible studies and community throughout the week. And to help us continue building community, we would love it if you popped into our chat and said hello. This way we can meet you and we can pray for you no matter where you are. Yeah, absolutely. Please do that. And before service begins, we're going to be playing a short round of trivia. On February 9th, we had another one of our Next Steps events where people had the opportunity to hear about the story of grace and find ways to get involved as a volunteer. So if you had the chance to attend this event, you may actually know the answers to some of these questions. That's right. And even if you do know the answer or maybe you're just guessing, we encourage you to participate with us as we go through these questions. Okay, Logan, so the first question is, which staff member used to be a private investigator? Private investigator. I think I know this one. Okay. Is it Jeff Gaston? It is. For those of you who may not know, Jeff Gaston, he is our Lakewood Ranch campus pastor and is known for being somewhat of a cheerleader around here at Grace with his encouraging and upbeat personality. Okay, my turn. Second question. When did we open the Bee Ridge campus? Oh man, I feel on the spot. Um, I'm gonna say 2018? Uh, it was October of 2019. Oh, so close. See, it's honestly crazy to think that Grace has actually existed since 2010. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, Grace has grown so much. Okay, next question. How many different ministries do we have available here at Grace? That's a tough one. Yeah. There are a lot. Whew. I'm going to say 27. Ooh, okay, that's a bit of a trick question. There's honestly too many to count. So you'll just have to check out the Connect page on our website to see what we've got going on. Okay, well, you got you got me there. I had no idea how I was gonna count all of them because there's so many. All right, last question. What is Pastor Chip's favorite carbonated beverage? Okay, I'm not really sure, but I'm gonna go with the only one I've seen him drink which is sparkling water, is that? It's actually Mountain Dew. Oh. See, I'm more of a Sprite guy myself, but go ahead and comment below if you're a Mountain Dew lover as well. Well, that's all the time we have for trivia, but if you are interested in learning more about Grace, go to the About tab on our website, gracearasota.com, to find out more. It's now time for our service to begin. Thank you all for joining us here this weekend at Grace, where everyone is welcome. Welcome home, Grace. Would you stand and worship with us today? I know there's a lot going on in this world right now, but we can stand here together and worship God. We can raise a hallelujah in the middle of the storm. Come on, there's something powerful in that. Let's worship together. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna sing. Oh, I'm gonna sing in the middle of a storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar from the ashes. Hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is alive. I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah 
incredible Savior we have. And before we go back into worship, I'm Logan, this is Micaiah, and we are so excited to have you here with us at our online campus. For those of you just tuning in, welcome to Grace. As always, we like to take a special moment to welcome anyone who may be a brand new guest to Grace. And if that's you, know that it's a big deal to us that you would take part of your weekend to join us virtually. And we would love to connect with you. And to help us do that, just head on over to gracesarasota.com and click the online tab at the top left-hand corner. There you can scroll all the way down to the hub where you can fill out our digital connect card. Yeah, and once you've filled out that form, we'll send you a free gift as our way of saying thank you for being here with us. I mean, come on. Who doesn't want a free gift? I, I want a free gift. And uh, speaking of gifts, we are truly grateful for each and every one of you. There is a lot happening here at Grace and plenty more events to come, but none of it would be possible if it weren't for your radical generosity. Like really, it's because of you that we can continue to be contagiously outrageous and continue changing the lives of people both within the church and in our surrounding community. And you can join us on this journey of generosity by looking at the bottom of the screen or clicking on the link provided in the chat. And here at Grace, we believe that giving isn't something God wants from you. It's what God wants for you. So we invite you to trust the Lord, watch Him move in your life, and see God use your generosity to impact lives. Let's take this time now to pause and pray to ask God to bless this week's offering. Father God, we love you. We thank you for the many gifts and blessings that you've given to us each and every day. And as we give to you, God, I pray that you would bless the gift, that you would multiply it, 
but also, God, that you would bless the giver. Because of the giving of this church, Father, let people hear the name of Jesus and let people come to know him as their Savior. God, we love you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Well, amen. Online family, thank you for joining us in prayer, and let's continue lifting up our praise to the name of Jesus through worship. Let's stand together. Uh, before we go into this song, it's called Promises, and it's kind of taken from that old song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Um, it's sort of inserted in there. Um, there are a lot of things going on in our world right now, and I'm sure all of you guys are aware you've been watching the news. Um, and honestly, this is not a new thing, right? There have been things going on um, since 2020 and really before that. Um, and a lot of us I know are coming in here burdened, maybe feeling like things are hopeless or just asking the question, God, where are you? How can I declare your faithfulness in a situation that may feel hopeless or in looking at situations across the world that just seem so horrible and awful? So I just want us to take this moment and authentically approach God and say to him, you are the God of Abraham. You're the God of covenant, of faithful promises to a thousand generations. And with that spirit, let's sing this together. You're faithful God, there's nothing you can do. We believe it in this place. Let's sing God of Abraham, God of covenant. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, a faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I remain steadfast. And let my heart burn when you speak a word, it will come to pass great is your faithfulness to me great is your faithfulness to me from the rising sun to the setting same I will praise your name great your faithfulness to me. Yeah. You're so faithful, God. Oh, from age to age, God, you are faithful. God, from age to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Yeah. Your history can prove there's nothing you can do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And then my heart burn when you speak a word in the On behalf of those that maybe can't in this moment. You've never let me down, God. You're faithful. You are faithful. I put my faith, my hope, my trust in you, God. Oh. He's a firm foundation. Blessing, I put my faith in Jesus. to the ground my hope and firm foundation he'll never let me down I put my faith in Jesus my anchor to the ground my hope and firm foundation he'll never let me down I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to 
Far be it from me to not believe. Far be it from me to not believe. Even when my eyes can't see. And this mountain that's in front of me. Will be thrown into the midst of the sea. Come on, let's sing. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you, Jesus. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you, it is well, it is well. Yeah. 
it is well with me. Let's sing this together. When peace like a river upsendeth my way, when so. right now as your people and those gathered online, those watching um, via all kinds of social media. Lord, we pause for just a moment to say, it is well with our souls. You are a faithful God. No matter what we see, no matter what goes on around us, we know that no matter even if we are in the fire, there is one in the fire with us. We stand on that right now. We believe that right now. And Lord, we gather as your people have gathered for so many, many years. When we gather, Lord, we sing songs, we lift you up, we pray. And Lord, we also intercede for other people. And Lord, right now as your church, Lord, we intercede for what's going on in a distant place in Europe right now. A war going on, Lord, innocent lives, innocent children, all kinds of things going on. Lord, there's pain, suffering, anxiety, depression. Lord, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would somehow send your peace to that region. Lord, send your peace. Lord, we, we, we don't even know exactly how to pray, but Lord, we pray 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I pray for the leaders of this world that they would have a realization that human lives matter, that children matter. Lord, that, that, that husbands and wives matter. Lord, Lord, please, for your glory and for your sake, Lord, we intercede. And we ask, Lord, that where our faith is lacking, give us faith, Lord, to believe. Lord, I just pray that you would really hear our prayers. Lord, I pray that you would use us in ways that we've never been used before. I pray, Lord, that you would just really wake us up, Lord, to to intercede for our world right now. Our world needs you, Lord, as bad as it's ever needed you. And I pray, Lord, that you would raise up your church in this dark hour, Lord, to shine the light of Jesus in the world. And Lord, I pray that as we also get ready now to go to your word, I pray, Lord, that you would challenge us. I pray that you would inspire us. Lord, I pray that you would enlighten us, Lord, so that we can be the people that you've called us to be. Speak to us, O Lord. Minister to us, not only us here, but those watching online. And Lord, we're gonna be very, very careful to give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Can you give the Lord a big hand clap and tell him that you you love him? You know, um, when I put sermon series together, um, you know, there's time and effort and thoughts and all kinds of things that go on. And I want to give you a little background as to this current series that we're going to start. It's called Captain of My Soul. You probably noticed the question mark at the end, and, and that question mark's there because we're going to be asking a lot of questions, some tough questions, some things that, that really um, speak to us. I think will challenge us. Uh, um, I think will inspire us and hopefully um, uh, give us a little bit of an excitement to just continue to grow and become all that God wants us to be. I can tell you that when I do put the series together, <clears throat> one of the things I've grown to know more and more over the years as I've pastored and as I've grown older and as I've spent more time in God's word, I- I've realized that people who do what I do, that I'm no more special than anybody else, but people who pastor, um, they're, they're a group of people that Paul in this incredible wisdom wrote to the church at Ephesus in chapter four. He said that God puts in the local church, he puts apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. And the word pastor and teacher is combined in the Greek with the word and. I think that it's probably one office. Um, some people would disagree, it's, it's, it's no big deal, but I tend to think that it's one, a pastor and a teacher is one particular role and office in the church. And Paul tells us when we gather and when I speak and do what I do, he tells me what my role and my responsibility actually is. And I take it really seriously. Here's what he says. You, you, may, you may have an idea of what you think a pastor and teacher should do and when we gather together, but this is, what, this is what Paul said to the church at Ephesus. He says, we gather, he says that people like me who do what I do are to equip the saints for the work of ministry. You may think that, you know, maybe we come to church to hear a song or, you know, hear a funny joke or whatever else that may be, and nothing may be necessarily wrong with any of those things. But what I can tell you is, is when we gather one of the things that's supposed to happen is you're supposed to get equipped. You're supposed to get some tools to put in your toolbox that enable you to do the work of ministry. And guess what? As soon as I'm done doing what I'm doing, I'm just like everybody else. I'm supposed to go out there and do the work of ministry as a Christian, just like everybody else. When we gather, we gather to get equipped. Now, if you're here and maybe you're going, I'm not really a believer. You're watching online. You're going, I don't know how I tuned in here. I was scrolling through Facebook and boom, here you are. I don't know what I'm doing here. Listen, we're glad you're here. You can belong here before you believe. But I think you would agree with me if you're not a believer. If you went to a Walgreens meeting, you probably would talk about Walgreens, right? You understand that. If you went to a Delta meeting, you probably would talk about flying planes and all of this other stuff, unless you were going to the Delta faucet meeting and you talk about faucets and those type of things. So when you come to church, it's probably not surprising to anybody that we talk about Jesus and read the Bible. At least it shouldn't be surprising. So if you're here, you can hang out with us. But but when we gather as the saints of God, we gather to get equipped so that we can go do the work of ministry, so that we can share Jesus, so that we can live a life that isn't bombarded with all kinds of stuff and we don't look any different than anybody else in the world, that we're equipped. He says, to equip the saints for the work of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. In other words, to continue to build up the body of Christ. Look at this, what he says. He says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. So when we come together, we're so focused about what we're doing. We're not distracted 
by all the other things. I think right there we could probably agree that the American church could probably go back and read this a little bit to the unity of faith, knowledge of the Son of God. Listen here, to mature manhood. That when we gather, when we go out, we're gonna reach the unchurched. But when we gather, we wanna be equipped to be able to be intentional neighbors that reflect Christ. That we, what we do here is to hopefully create mature Christians. That when the world's falling apart, when things are going bad, when, when you don't know what's going on, <clears throat> that you're the people that the world looks at and says, what do you have? What is it about you that you can say it is well with my soul? How can you say great is thy faithfulness? What do you have? Who is it that you know? Paul says, all this should happen to grow up to the measure of the fullness of Christ for a reason, so that equip the saints to work the ministry, to build up the body of Christ, to do all these great things so that we're no longer children tossed to and fro by the waves. Just everything in life, just sort of doing this. And you may go, man, that's me right now. That's why we gather. That's why we go to the word of God. Because as your pastor, what I wanna do is I want to help you become all the things that God wants you to be. I want you to do all the things that God has called you to. To do. He says, so that we're no longer children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. And so when, when, when we gather, I try my best to put stuff together that will help you in your Christian life, whether it's to learn to read the Bible better, to learn to pray a little bit better, to learn to grow a little bit more, to push you a little bit, to make you uncomfortable at, at times, to maybe push you a little bit to get out of the boat. So I wanna be honest with you, in this series, I'm going to take on some very, very, very tough things. And, and here's, the, here's the problem when you take on tough things. N number one, not everybody always likes what you have to say. I get that but I'm not being snarky and I'm not trying to make you mad at me or anything like that, but I just want you to give me some grace because when I look around the world and I see what's going on, and as a pastor, I see that 23% of the church left last year in the American church disappeared, not coming back. As a pastor, I go, you know what? It's time to really get in and dig and get tough and make sure that the people here at Grace are walking in all of the things that God has for them. And so I'm gonna say some things that might push you a little bit, might get you a little bit, uh, a little bit. It's okay, but it's okay, I love you. And, and, and if you hate me, wait till the end of the series before you fully hate me because it, it not only give me grace, but also hear me out because I'm not perfect. I don't say everything exactly perfectly, but I think if you will listen to the entire series and listen to everything that I have to say, you will hear my heart. And so let's start this series <clears throat> by learning a new word. I did not know this word. Um, Alan Noble, who is a literature professor at a Christian university, wrote a book. And some of the book is when I was reading the first parts of it, it, it hit me that, hey, this is, this is something that, that really needs to be dealt with. And he taught me a word that I didn't know. Now, if you know this word, God bless you. I mean, if you really know this word, that's awesome. You have a better vocabulary than I do. I did not know this word. And the word was zucosis. Some of you all are probably, you know it. Probably everybody in here knows it. Online's going, I've known this for years. You know, I, I may have some people that come out of the charismatic and Pentecostal church that go, that's tongues, isn't it? You know, so, um, you know, but the, but, the, but the point is, is that, so when, when you see zucosis, what is that? Well, zucosis is actually a medical term for animals that are in captivity. Let me give you the definition of zucosis. It's when zoo animals exhibit signs of extreme depression and related psychological conditions as they struggle with the confines of their captivity. So check this out, this is incredible. When they bring an animal into captivity, <clears throat> they have somebody that understands that animal better than anybody else in the world. And they, and they understand that animal better than that animal understands itself. And they create an environment that is perfect for that animal. I mean, they spend hundreds and hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars doing research on creating these perfect environments for these animals. But what happens when they get there, they get sick. 
that no matter how great that environment is, no matter how perfect that environment is, they get sick. And what they do is they start pacing. And if you've ever been to a zoo and you see a track where the animals pace, they have zoocosis. When they excessively groom, they have zoocosis. They're sick. They're sick in the greatest environment that is made just for that animal. It's incredible. And there's only two ways to treat zoocosis, antidepressants and distraction. You may go, hey, think about that for a second. And think about this. Think about our world for a second. Think about the depression going on. And listen, let me make sure it's very clear here. I always gotta make sure that I, I, I wish I didn't have to do this, but I need to do this. If you have depression and you're suffering from depression and you're on medicine or whatever else, I'm not trying to give you a hard time. I hope that, I wish people would just believe that when people like me say these things. I'm not trying to give anybody a hard time. I'm just saying, hey, if you don't realize that depression is going on all around our world, um, you're probably not paying that much attention. It's everywhere. Screen time. Do you know the average American spends 11 hours a day looking at a screen? whether it be a phone, a computer, or a TV. Do you know that number was 19 hours during the height of the pandemic? It's only 24 hours in a day. I mean, my God, what were you all doing? You know, I mean, I mean, 19 hours in front of a screen. Binge watching, some of you are like, whoa, 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 don't get on my jam now. This is, this is, this is, no, but, but I mean, people will sit and stare at a TV for hours upon hours upon hours and everybody's looking for a distraction. So here's what I wanna ask you, because I'm I'm wading into this very slowly, but I wanna ask you a question. Is it possible that in our attempts at being fully human, gonna be who I wanna be, I'm gonna be living my best life, I'm gonna, gonna, if it's up to, if it's gonna be, it's up to me, is it possible that in our attempts at being fully human, We've actually created an environment that makes us ill. Is that possible? Is it possible that when we look around the world and everybody says, I'm gonna do me, I'm gonna be who I am, don't tell me who I, don't don't get in my grill, don't tell me about, I'm going to be authentic. Maybe it's like the poem that many of you all probably know. You may not know the name of the poem, you may not know who wrote it, but you probably know some lines. And if you don't know the lines from the poem, you've probably heard some lines in songs. William Henley had tuberculosis and he had an amputation on one of his legs. He was gonna have to have another amputation and he got a second opinion and ended up a doctor, did a lot of work on his foot and he didn't have to get that second amputation. But in the process of going all of doing all of that, he, he, he wrote a poem called Invictus, which, which means unconquerable. And, and it, was, it was in the face of this, I'm going to be fully human and I'm gonna attack this with everything within me. And here's, here's what the, the, the poem says, the last four verses. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. So he's, he's been around church. So it doesn't make a difference what, how, how straight God's gate is or whatever else, or all he says about the punishments that might come for those. Who, that, I don't have time for that. I'm gonna stand as a human being, be fully human. He says, I am the master of my fate and I am the captain of my soul. And some of you may be going, amen. Well, I'm gonna ask you a tough question. Is this true? Is it true that you're the captain of your own soul? Is it true that I'm the captain of my own soul? Is that true? Is it true that our humanity is determined by us. We're the ones who get to determine our humanity. We're the ones who get to create the environments. We're the ones who get to say, this is what we ought to do. We ought to give kids iPads and have them watch TV and teach them all this stuff and do all this stuff. Is this, what, is this the world, the way we want to determine it? Because here's the reality, our humanity, if it's determined by us, that means that our identity, it's up to us. We can identify anything that we want to identify be whatever we wanna be, do whatever we wanna do. Don't tell me what my identity is. Don't even begin to tell me what that should look like because I am the captain of my own soul. 
Don't push any of that stuff on me. Don't get in my grill. Don't try to tell me whatever. My identity is determined by me because my humanity is determined by me. And don't tell me what success looks like because I'm gonna determine what success looks like. And don't tell me what life's meaning is all about because I'm the one who gets to determine all of that. Is that true? Is this, is this true? Because this is the spirit of the age. I'm trying to attack the very, very thing that I really believe is creating a lot of the problems, if not the main thing that's creating the problems in our world today is that we have a humanity that is said, don't get in my way. Don't tell me what to do. I am the master of my fate and I am the captain of my soul. Now think about this for a second. This is true. And many Christians think this is true. It's seeped into the church. And now we're taking passages and rewriting them and redoing stuff with the Bible because, because we wanna be the ones who ultimately determine who we are. Alan Noble in his book, quote, he doesn't believe this, but this is what he says about this right here. Absolutely fascinating, think about this. If you're the captain of your soul, if your humanity, your identity, your meaning and your success, if my meaning, my identity and my success is up to me, then here's the reality. If I'm completely responsible for my life, then the greatest moral failure would be for me to fail to pursue what I desire most. Been married for 10 years, I don't feel it anymore. I'm the captain of my soul. It would be inauthentic of me to stay married because I should be happy. I, I, I should be the one who determines what goes on in my life. I should be the one who gets to choose what I wanna be and what I wanna identify as or whatever it may be. I get to choose that because the greatest moral failure would be for me not to do what I think is best. Forget everybody else. I'm the captain of my own soul. I don't belong to anybody. In fact, I control everything. Is that true? Is that, is that really the truth? Well, I'd, I'd like to suggest an alternative. I'd like, to, I'd like to kindly suggest that there might be a better way. And that would be that our humanity is determined by God. That God is the one who gets to tell us what our identity, our success, and our meaning actually is. He's the one. And this is the rub. It's the rub for everybody. Who is the captain of your soul? Who is that? We see all the time, you see Christian books, you see magazines, your best life's all about you. Jesus is almost like a self-help coach, right? Just get a little bit of Jesus in your life and if you, that's the missing little ingredient that you needed to become all that you wanna do and all that you wanna be. Or is that, is that the spirit of the age? Is that, is that the world that has crept in to where the saints gather? And now the church is all, it's about me, it's about my wants and what I want and don't tell me and don't put that on me and I don't care what it offends, I don't care who it messes up, I don't care who it offends, I don't care what it does, I am the captain of my own soul. Well, this isn't new, this is the beauty of scripture. This is the beauty of the word of God. The first book in the Bible is called Genesis, most of you know that. When I'm trying to be funny in a class or whatever, I always go, turn to the table of contents and turn right and you'll be there. <clears throat> the book of Genesis is um, this incredible theological book that's telling us so much about you and me and about our relationship with God. And yet we sit and argue over things about that book that that book's not even talking about. Like Moses wasn't sitting around going, oh, I wonder what the scientists are gonna think. And he, he wasn't thinking about that at all. He was coming out of Egypt. He was trying to help the people that came out of Egypt to understand who God was and what that meant and that there weren't multiple gods. There was one God and that human beings had value because the God that would put his image and likeness in the temple, like in the Egyptians, it'd be a piece of wood or a piece of stone, that the likeness and image that God put in his creation were people. The people mattered. Unlike in Egypt where people were just a commodity, and it didn't make a difference what you did with people as long as you just could continue to build and build and build because the gods needed work. He says, I, 
created me. And it's not by accident that he created a man and a woman. You can try to retrofit that, but that's what he did. He created a man and a woman. Like he didn't go, oh, you know what? Back then I blew it. I didn't understand how everything was gonna actually work out in 2022. He knew what he was doing. He knew how to create a family. He knew how to create who we were. And he creates this beautiful couple and he walks with them and he talks with them and he has an intimacy with them. But they decided they wanted to do it their own way. I don't know how Frank Sinatra ended up in the garden, but (laughs) he did. And they decided to do it their own way. Well, when they did that, God said to them that there was gonna be repercussions. And the repercussions, when you read in Genesis 3, is that the ground wasn't gonna produce very well for them. They were gonna have to really work hard to produce that ground. But in verse 15, God gave a promise. And we Christians go back and look at that and we understand what it is. He said to the woman that with her seed, he would bring forth a person that would conquer the serpent that had deceived them. It's interesting because he says he promised her a seed. Women don't have seed. You got the virgin birth all the way back in Genesis 3.15. God knew what he was doing. The Bible's not a hodgepodge book of words, folks. It's the word of God. God knew what he was doing. You just read the scriptures and you go, there's no way in the world. Nobody could have done this. You can't go to any library with me and pull 66 book off the shelf and find themes all through those 66 books that agree. You got 40 different authors over 1,500 to 2,000 different years in different physical geographical locations. And the Bible starts with a wedding in the garden and ends with a wedding in the garden. It starts with a serpent and it, it, the serpent is destroyed at the end of the book of Revelation. I mean, it, it, you, just don't, you just don't make this stuff up. This is, this is God is at work here. And he, he promises the woman that she's gonna have a seed. Well, then we get to Genesis 4. And I'm not gonna be able to go through all this. We're gonna go through this again. This is just the introduction. I'm trying to whet your appetite. I'm trying to get you to start thinking that, wow, man, maybe, maybe there's something here. Maybe, maybe, I know he's from Kentucky. He can't be that intelligent, but, but maybe there's something there that he's saying out of the word of God that might be for me. So in Genesis chapter four, we're told that now Adam knew Eve, his wife. This word new, it's not like he knew her, like, oh, you're Eve. This is an intimacy here. This is them coming together. This is the way God intended things. Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Now, some of the translations, New American Standard for sure, italicizes some of those words. And it actually has a footnote. It says, could be this. Literally, the Hebrew, literally. This is what the Hebrew says. And it creates all kinds of problems for Bible translators because they just go, I don't know what to do. But this is literally what the grammar says and especially fits the context. The grammar actually says, I've gotten the man, comma, the Lord. That's the literal translation of the Hebrew. Well, that creates a big problem. <laughs> People who, who translate the Bible go, how in the world could Eve have thought that she might have had a man that could be God, that could have like solved all the problems? Uh, just a chapter before God told her that. So she thinks that when she has this son, Cain, that this is gonna be the one that redeems everything which is why he works the ground because he's gonna be the one that redeems. That's in her mind, she thinks this. You could understand how she could think this. And so she's now put an identity on her son. Interesting. She has another son. Well, actually Martin Luther, the great, the great reformer, here's what he says in his commentary on Genesis. In her great joy and reverence, she did not want to call her offspring a son 
for she believed that he was to be much more, the man who was to bruise the serpent's head. Therefore, she called him the man, the Lord. She thought that he, Cain, was the one whom the Lord had meant when he said, thy seed shall bruise the serpent's head. This is not like an off sort of crazy interpretation. This is, goes all the way back to Luther. There's plenty of commentators that see this. They just don't know what to do with it. Luther knew what to do with it. He understood what was going on. But what's interesting is, is when she has the next child, Abel. You know what the Hebrew word Abel means? Anybody ever read the book of Ecclesiastes? I don't know what translation you have. It may say vanity and vanity and vanity and vanity. Or it may seem, say meaningless, 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 meaningless. Same Hebrew word is Abel. Why is he... <laughs> Why is he meaningless? Why is he vanity? Well, because Cain is the one that's gonna bring it all together. Well, when they bring their sacrifices, God doesn't respond to Cain. Can you imagine the young man that's been groomed his entire life and told what he is? It doesn't work. And of course, the one that's meaningless and vanity is the one that God does respond to. And let me tell you something, because Genesis is all about theology. You think your life is meaningless? You think your life is vanity? Let me tell you something. There is a God who is willing to take you and accept you for who you are. Because that's what he does. What happens? What happens? In this? We're gonna go through this passage again in depth, but I don't have time to get through it on this weekend because some of you all like 30 minute messages. Um, I could do three hours and, you know, um, but I don't know that everybody would show up. Be like, yeah, we really like that guy, but that other church is feeling a little bit better right now. I feel led, you know. So anyway, coming back here. So, so, so what happens when this goes down and the sacrifices are done and everything? Well, we're told that when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and he killed him. What's that? What's that telling us? This, this is rich. This is rich what's going on here in Genesis. And then, and then we're told this. We're told that Cain went away from the presence of the Lord. And he went east of Eden. And that's a refrain you get in Genesis over and over again. People keep moving east of Eden. Why does it say that? And then we're told he knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch when he built a city. Why did he go build a city? Why did he build a city? Like, why is he doing that? And why does Genesis tell us all about these cities till finally chapter 11 till we get this really big city, Babel, that's trying to grow all the way up into heaven? What's Genesis telling us? Why then in chapter 12, does Abraham have to leave his city and take a journey? Why are we told in Hebrews 11 that Abraham was seeking another city whose builder and maker is God? What are we being told? Well, I can tell you, and this is the stuff we're gonna look at, in this series, we're gonna to start to realize that our identity shapes us. That who we think we are and what we think we're here for, it shapes us. And that mistaken identity kills relationships and separates us from God. Is there, how could God have known? How could Moses have known? He was writing stuff that would be so appropriate for today because Moses wasn't just the one who wrote those words. God is telling us about us and our humanity and all that back right there in Genesis. And not only that, but we also are gonna struggle with the tension of the city because the city is where we go to find people that will do it our way. And let me just tell you this. I want you to hear me. When I'm teaching classes, Oftentimes, I will have students that come up and say, Dr. Chip or Dr. Bennett or whatever they call me, um, they'll say, I hear what you're saying about the Bible. And I hear what you're saying about stuff, but you got your truth and I got my truth. I say, really? Okay. Do you think you got your truth and I got my truth? Uh-huh. Because I say, because really, I mean, at the end of the day, truth can't be known. And I'm like, really? That's interesting. Because if truth can't be known, then how do you know that truth can't be known is in fact true? 
they go, it's just self-defeating. There's a problem there. There's also a problem with identity that we think is from within. This is who I am. This is me. No, 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 no. Identity is always from without. There's never been one person in the world that has decided, here is my identity that didn't go and say, let me tell you, because you gotta get validation. You're wired that way. Your identity doesn't come from within. Your identity comes from without. And the only one that can give you your true identity is the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to hear me. I want you to listen because we're gonna talk about these things because there, 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 there is a need for truth in today's world. There's a need for leadership in today's world. And I'm just at the place in my life where I know that I gotta stand before a holy and righteous God. There is a sick world right now. And the answer is so clear and so precise. The answer is the one who was the carpenter from Nazareth, who died on a cross for our sins and rose again on the third day. And when we start seeking him, we understand. I was at dinner just a few nights ago with Dr. Mark Rutland. He spoke here not too long ago. I had taken a group of people up for a leadership conference. And I I do wanna say thanks to the two young men that spoke while I was gone last weekend, Chris Absher and Chris Pedro. If you weren't at Bee Ridge, Chris Pedro spoke, but thank God for them. And we took a bunch of people up there and I, I was sitting with Dr. Rutland and he said to me, he said, I don't know that I've met anybody in my life that is any more wired than you are. You have a lot of energy. It's funny because I don't really think I got that much energy, but evidently I do. So, um, but he was, in, 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 and I, I said, you know what? I said, but that energy and that drivenness, I have to watch because if, if, if I push too hard, I can, I can wear people out. You know what I could have done? I could have done this. I could have, it's who I am. It's who I am. I'm gonna be authentic. It's gonna be who I am. If you don't like who I am, too bad. I know, I know 40 of the staff quit last week, but this is who I am. Just got it, got it. No, 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 no. I know as a theologian that I live in a fallen world and that who I am is not exactly what God wants me to be. And so I have to look into the word of God and realize what the fruit of the spirit is, gentleness and kindness and patience. And I have to say, it doesn't make a difference what I think I am. I've got to be what God says I am. And I've got to be the way God wants me to be because he knows what it means to be truly human. So here's what I want you to do. And I want you to do this with me. First of all, these are the takeaways. I want you to start asking Jesus right now to help expose areas in our life where we're currently the captain of our own soul. I want you to have the rich young ruler moment where you may go, well, I've got this and I love Jesus and I do these things right and I do these things right. And Jesus goes, yes, but this is the one thing that's keeping you from being all that you can be, from truly living the life I've called you to lead. lead. Go sell everything and give it to the poor. I don't know what that is for you, but would you say, God, would you maybe start? Why, why would you not? I mean, why would you not wanna live the life that God wants us to live if he knows what it means to be truly human and he's the one that says he can give us abundant life and he's the one that says he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think, why would we not wanna get on his program? Second thing that I want you to do and I want you to think about and pray about is I want you to pray that we will be open to being challenged in some core belief structures that might be more aligned with this world than with Jesus. Why am I saying all this? Because church, I believe that right now is the time for God's church to awake and to get out of the slumber and to get out of playing with the world and start to live a life that is pleasing fully to God, to live in all the things that God has for you and me, because I believe we have a world that is so desperate for Jesus, that if we can get our act together and walk in the ways that God wants us to walk, I think we will be blown away at what God will do. Blown away. 
And so I would ask you, just say, God, help me, help me. I know this is challenging, help me. And just so that you know, Paul said, we shouldn't be conformed to this world, but we should be transformed. We gotta get out of the world. Um, the the J.B. Phillips translation says it this way. He says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. And the last thing, and this is really where I wanna go in this whole series, is I want you to wrestle with this question. Are we really even capable of truly knowing ourselves and our identity apart from knowing and being known by God? Is it even possible? You may disagree with the psalmist, but you can't disagree with what he's saying. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart, because I can't really know my own heart, God. I, I need you to search me. I need you to look inside of me, because I probably wouldn't have woken up and said that I'm separated from you. I probably wouldn't have woken up and realized that when somebody slapped me, I should turn the other cheek. Lord, I need you to search me and know me. I need you to try me and know my thoughts and see. Like, I can't, I don't know. See if there be any grievous way in me and you lead me into the way everlasting. You, you lead me. Because Lord, if I'm left to my own devices, I'll, I'll try to figure out even as a Christian how to make you work within my own world because really at the essence of my life, I wanna be the captain of my own soul. I don't really want you to. And I want you to just be open to letting the word of God share who we are. What is our identity? What does it really mean to have a right relationship? And, and when we have a wrong and mistaken identity, we actually harm others and we separate ourselves from God. And to realize the tension of the city that so many of us are working for the here and now and we need to elevate our minds and our hearts to the city that's gonna come. We need to be laying up treasures there, not here. And I know that's tough. It's tough for many of us. But as your pastor, I feel like I have a role and a responsibility to equip and train God's people to be all that God has called them to be. And I feel like I'm not doing a very good job if I just tell you that Jesus is your savior and don't also tell you that Jesus is your Lord because he's both. We're gonna sing a final song and I'm hoping that God's peace settles on us and allows us to start thinking about these things. God, wake me up at night. Give me a dream. Shape me. Use friends. Lord, I want you to be the captain of my soul. And as your pastor, I want you to know that in my own personal life, I want God to be the captain of my soul. And I want God to be the captain of your soul. And I want him to be willing to shine lights in ways that are tough. As he starts to whittle away, it hurts sometimes, but he's conforming us to the image of his son. Let me pray for everybody here and those that are online. Father, for your glory and for your glory alone. I pray, Lord, that right now and as we go into this series, Lord, I pray that you would do some work in our hearts. Lord, my, my thoughts are that every one of us, myself included, have areas that we've protected, hidden, refused to really put in your light to really allow you to be the captain of our soul. I pray, Lord, that we would think about that over the next several weeks. I pray that you would grow us up. I pray that you would do it in love, do it in truth. Help us, Lord, to see those things that you see. And Lord, I pray that you would bring peace over all of us to start that work. And Lord, I pray right now, if anybody in here, anybody online wants to make the decision right now to move towards you, that they would. Maybe they've never known you. Maybe they've never had a relationship with you. 
I pray that where they are right now, whether in their seat or online, they would say, God, I need you in my life. I've been doing life my way. I need to do life your way. Lord, I know I've done plenty of things wrong. Would you forgive me? I I, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again on the third day for eternal life. Just make that move towards God. And if you're here and you know that you're a believer, but you know that there was a little bit of ouch, a little bit of, ugh, I pray that you would also say, God, help me to move towards you to become the captain of my soul. Lord, I pray that you would bring a peace right now for your surgery to start in all of us so that we can become the people that you've called us to be. We love you and we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Would everybody stand and let's sing the song together. Let's ask the Lord to bring some peace.
Thank you for joining us this weekend. Before you leave, we would love the opportunity to connect with you. So please stop by our hub at gracesarasota.com slash online where you can fill out our digital connect card, post to our virtual prayer wall, and learn more about upcoming online groups and events. Yeah, we really do want to be your church family. So if you'd like to pray with somebody or just if you want to share something from today's service that was really impactful, we would love to hear from you. Either send an email to grace at gracesarasota.com or you can call the number that's on the screen and in the chat. Now, Grace family, it is time for all of us to go out and reach the unchurched by being those intentional neighbors God is calling us to be. We love you, we're praying for you, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. And don't forget to invite a friend. We'll see you all next week.